Next, in our 16.2 subsection, we're going to pick up again with our supply side policies and take a look at some of the options. So the first thing to recognize here is we want to have a rightward shift of the aggregate supply curve. You notice in our graph, we're at aggregate supply curve one and we're at equilibrium on the aggregate demand curve at E1. If we can do something that can make a rightward shift to aggregate supply curve two, you notice we actually have two good things happen at the same time. You notice on the x-axis, which is measuring output, we've increased output from E1 to E2. And then on the y-axis, we have the price level and you notice the prices are coming down. So we actually get two good things out of the shift in to the right of the aggregate supply curve. We both increase output, which will of course reduce unemployment and increase people's incomes and simultaneously have a reduction in the, um, the inflation rate. So the aggregate demand curve shifting can't do this. And as we saw earlier, that's one of the things we talked about with the stagflation argument was that you can't simultaneously get an increase in output and a reduction in inflation by shifting the aggregate demand curve. So if, there, if you have the ability to change the aggregate supply curve, this could be a good thing. And of course, well, let's go ahead and finish up this, uh, this slide and point out um, if we really screwed up and shifted the aggregate supply curve to the left, then you would have really bad news because then you would uh, be damaging two good things at the same time. You would be reducing output, which increases unemployment, and you would be increasing inflation, which is a bad thing as well. So we definitely want to have rightward shifts in aggregate supply. We don't want to have leftward shifts. Now, um, let's just sum this up real quickly. When the aggregate supply curve shifts to the right, then the Phillips curve, which was that unemployment trade-off of graph, shifts to the left. Now for it, that's a good thing. Shifting the, aggregate, the Phillips curve to the left is a good thing because remember, on the Phillips curve, the x-axis is not measuring output, it's measuring unemployment. So shifting left would be moving toward the origin, which is zero, right? And of course, zero unemployment would be really, really wonderful. So clearly moving to the left on the Phillips curve is a good thing. And of course, as we've already pointed, pointed out, this eases what's called the inflation unemployment trade-off. If we can shift the aggregate um, supply curve to the right, we don't have to have increases in inflation in order to have reductions in unemployment. You can have both reductions in unemployment and reductions in um, inflation at the same time. Whereas if we um, shift the aggregate supply curve to the left, then the Phillips curve shifts to the right, and that makes the inflation unemployment trade-off even more severe, meaning you have both inflation and employment rising at the same time. This leads us to something called the misery index. Uh, the misery index uh, is a basically it's, it's a graph or index where you add together the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. So when both of these things are moving in the same direction upward, because we have the problem of uh, shifting the aggregate supply curve to the left instead of to the right, we realize we're adding two bad things together. So the misery index would be a really nice measure of how bad things are in the economy. And you notice when you look at the graph back in the 1970s up to, the, up to 1980, look, especially in 1980, you can see the misery index together hit 20%, rather hit 20, because the inflation rate was high and the unemployment rate was high at the same time, leading to a very high misery index. Whereas you can see over here in the year 2000, the uh, misery index actually got below four, which is a really amazing number because that means the, both the inflation rate and the unemployment rate were so low, even when added together, they didn't even hit the number four. That's an incredible accomplishment. So obviously the world's much better off with low misery index numbers than with high misery index numbers. If, you can, if, the, if the aggregate supply curve shifts to the left, that drives up the misery index. If it shifts, um, if it shifts to the right, then it drives down the misery index. Now let's talk about some policy tools. What can we actually do to shift the aggregate supply curve? We've just been talking about it in theoretical generalities. Now let's get down to some brass tacks. What actually does shift the aggregate supply curve to the right? Because that's the only one we want to do. Okay, so basically we have to provide some kind of incentive for suppliers of resources to increase their production. 
Let's go through a quick list here on our little bullet statements. Tax incentives for saving, investment, and work. If you can have the tax code rewritten in such a way, and we'll go through an example by the end of today's lecture on 16.2, we'll find that there could be a reason why both workers and business owners want to increase their work effort, their savings, their investments, and that's all good things because all of those things shift the productive capacity of the country to the right on the graph, which is increasing output. Anything we can do to increase human capital investment. Now remember, human capital, we did that way back at the beginning of our semester. Human capital is the skills and training that workers have. And so if workers um, become more skilled and have deeper and better training and better educations, they're obviously able to be more productive at higher tasks, higher quality tasks, and instead of just doing you know, things with manual labor with no skill, to be able to program computers, you know, all the different um, technically difficult things there are to do in life, the more your workers can do with those things, the higher the productivity of your society, and therefore, by definition, you're shifting the aggregate supply curve to the right. Deregulation refers to removing government regulations when those regulations have become onerous. Now, some regulation is necessary for society. We can think of safety regulations and things like that. But even safety regulations can be overdone, where the total value of the regulation is actually lower than the cost of the regulation. When that starts happening, then of course, instead of shifting the aggregate supply curve to the right, you start shifting it to the left because you reduce the ability of your, of your society to produce goods and services for any level of work effort. Trade liberalization, that refers to removing trade barriers. Trade barriers are essentially a self-imposed restriction on your own economy. And it's kind of like driving a car with the emergency brake on, as an analogy. Uh, so trade restrictions can damage the ability of the economy to improve. So removing trade restrictions can accelerate the growth of the economy, shifting the aggregate supply curve to the right. And then certainly, last but certainly not least, infrastructure development. Infrastructure refers to things like roads, bridges, dams, uh, power lines, uh, ports uh, for, for shipping to come into. All of those um, governmentally owned uh, basic parts of the economy that support other parts of the economy are incredibly valuable, as you might imagine. Just picture what the United States' total productivity capacity would be if we had never built the interstate highways. Everything travels on a regular highway with traffic lights, like Highway 41. Just picture truckers trying to get from Atlanta down to Tampa, for instance, on Highway 41. Uh, you could imagine how long it would take to, to, for that trip to take place. So what would happen to shipping costs? They would increase dramatically, wouldn't they? And the cost of virtually everything in society has to be shipped at one point or another. Costs would rise with no offsetting benefits of quality or anything else and therefore we clearly would have a, a major leftward shift in our aggregate supply curve. And vice versa, if we have really well-designed highways and we build enough of them that the traffic can continue to flow and we don't get bogged down in, in traffic jams, then the ability of your um, society to be more productive is clearly evident. So that would be just an example of how infrastructure development can benefit a society. All of the things I just mentioned generate what are called desirable macro outcomes in other words, they make the macroeconomic environment for productivity to be better than it otherwise would be. Now let's talk about tax incentives. Since we mentioned um, so at the very beginning of the previous slide, we started talking about incentives to get people to both work more, for businesses to invest more, and things like that. Now, many people, especially who are referred to as supply side economists, economists interested in shifting the aggregate supply curve talk about tax incentives. Now, they are not the only ones to talk about taxes. Keynesians want to cut taxes as well, but their main goal is to change aggregate demand. I think it's pretty obvious to everybody, if the government cuts taxes, that means you have more disposable income in your paycheck. And if you have more disposable income, you're bound to spend some of it, and that increases the total demand. So Keynesians, when they look at tax cuts, they're focusing on the aggregate demand impact. But this particular chapter is on supply side. So we're gonna spend most of our time talking about what other reason could you have for modifying taxes besides trying to shift the aggregate demand curve? Can you also shift the aggregate supply curve? So 
It turns out, let's read the next point. Our supply siders note that high tax rates can destroy the incentive to work and produce, and that, of course, reduces output. So if you can lower tax rates and it encourages people to earn more because more, it ends up more income and disposable income, less goes to the government, and that shifts people's incentives to work. Now, we're going to go through an example of that in a minute. So let's go ahead and look at that, an example. Uh, let's do a little, but before we get to the actual example, let's talk about uh, another technical issue dealing with taxes. The impact of marginal tax rates. Supply siders, who are, that refers to economists who put a preponderance of emphasis on shifting the aggregate supply curve, they emphasize a reduction in marginal tax rates for both workers and firms. What's the marginal tax rate? Well, the marginal tax rate compares to or is used in opposition to the average tax rate. The marginal tax rate is the tax rate that's imposed on the latest earned dollar of income, otherwise known as the marginal income. And it turns out that high marginal tax rates provide disincentives to increase earnings, which impacts labor supply. It provides a disincentive to start or expand a business impacting entrepreneurship and uh, high ta marginal tax rates provide disincentives to increase investment spending, which impacts corporate investment. Now on this slide, we're actually going to run through some numbers to try to illustrate these concepts. The first thing I want you all to recognize is the words we used on the previous slide to describe marginal tax rates, we're actually going to go through a very simple example to illustrate how you calculate the marginal tax rate. Let's take a look at the numbers here on this particular slide, and let's start with tax system A. There's going to be two different tax systems illustrated here, tax system A and tax system B. With tax system A, we tax 30% of the first $100, so $30 worth of taxes, and then 50% on the next $100 or anything earned over $100. So this person happens to have income of $200, so what's the total tax going to be? $30 on the first $100, $50 on the second hundred for a total of $80 in taxes. And that's where this number is coming from. Now, what's the average tax rate this person is paying? I mean, we know that they're paying 30% on the first hundred and 50% on the second hundred. So what's the average tax rate? It's 40%. And how do we get that number? It's $80 of taxes in total divided by $200 of income. The tax is 40% of your income. But you notice the marginal tax rate or the extra tax on any extra income earned is not at the 30% level, it's being taxed at the higher 50% level. So your marginal tax rate is 50%. Now let's take a look at tax system B. Tax system B is set up in a very different way. It's set up where you pay 50% on the first $100 instead of 30%. So this person pays 50 bucks on the first $100, but only 30% on any income you earn over $100. So it turns out in this particular example, what's the total taxes paid? It's still $80 because that was done deliberately. To we're trying to illustrate a point. In these two tax systems, whether, you, whether it's tax system A or tax system B, you're going to pay $80 worth of tax. And that's going to put you in the 40% average tax bracket. But let's look at this number right here. You notice this marginal number says 30%. And that's because any income earned over $100 is taxed at the lower rate of 30%. It turned out that we set the numbers up to give exactly equal outcomes initially. What's going to be interesting is what's going to happen in the future. So let's go to our next um, slide to illustrate that point. Okay, on this slide, this is the real bread and butter slide. This really explains why um, marginal tax rates are so important. So on all of the, you know, the boxes that you see that are in color, you recognize that it's just the exact same numbers from the previous slide copied over here. But now in the box down here, we're going to take a look at, look at future income. So let's just read it together. Now consider a worker or an investor considering taking a new job or investing in a new company. They expect to earn an additional $100 this period. So they're hoping to push their income from $200 up to $300. Now, in tax system A, remember what the marginal tax rate is. Anything over $100 is taxed at 50%. So if this person earns an extra 
how much extra taxes will they pay? They will pay $50 of extra taxes out of the extra $100 earned. So how much will their disposable income be? The disposable income will be $50. Now, under tax system B, earning the extra $100 will be taxed at a 30% rate. So what's the tax they pay? $30, 30% of 100, right? So out of the $100 they earned, if they pay $30 in taxes, how much will their disposable income increase? It will increase by $70. So now we finally answer our final question in blue. Which tax system elicits the most production? Does everyone agree that system B will tend to have more people working harder and investing more to earn extra income? Because if you get to keep $70 out of every 100 you earn, you will have a stronger incentive to do the extra work than if you only keep $50 out of your extra $100. Let me give you a practical example. I, I use this all the time when I'm teaching because it uh, really does apply to me. Uh, I don't know how you, if you all know this, but professors generally um, don't have to teach in the summer. Uh, we do if we voluntarily, you know, our bosses ask us, do you want to teach this summer? But it's not part of our contract. Our contract is the normal school year, the fall semester and the spring semester. Summer semesters are optional. So picture um, me getting an offer from Mercer. Uh, Mr. Petrano, would you be willing to come and teach this you know, MBA class this summer? And I'm thinking, hmm, I have a sailboat down in Florida. I'd really rather be on my sailboat. I really don't want to have to stay in Atlanta and, and you know, teach over the summer. But I also like money because I get to buy things uh, both for my boat and my house and my wife. Love, you know, she's really happy when I make extra money. So uh, I have a strong incentive to also do the extra work. Now let's consider the taxes. If we live under tax system A, if I earn extra money for Mercer, it'll be taxed at 50 percent and I'll only get to keep half of it. So now I'm looking at, hmm, you know, Mercer's offering me a, a nice salary to do this. But by the time I pay my taxes on it, what I'm left with is only about half of it. Now I got to think, hmm, for just half the amount of money they're offering me, what would I rather do? Would I rather go to just tell them, no, sorry, I don't want to do it. I'd rather go sailing. Or do I say, no, I'll give up my summer of sailing and I'll continue teaching. Does everyone recognize under tax system B, if it's only a 30% tax on the same amount of extra income I earned for the summer, then if I turn Mercer down and go sailing, now I'm giving up a lot of extra disposable income, right? Does everyone recognize that a professor has a much stronger incentive to teach in the summer under tax system B than under tax system A? Okay, just common sense, right? This is not some, you know, uh, difficult theory to understand. Economists make the argument that everyone, not just professors thinking about teaching in the summer, think like this. If you're thinking about getting a promotion, let's say your boss wants to transfer you to Dallas and you're going to take this nice big promotion because of you know new job responsibility, you're going to be working a lot harder, working more hours, but you also get a much nicer salary. If you're living in tax system A, you start to wonder, uh, maybe I shouldn't accept that job. By the time I pay my taxes, it just isn't worth moving to Dallas and taking on all these extra responsibilities. But under tax system B, where you get to keep most of the money, then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, I guess I think I will take that, um, that promotion. This could be a really good deal for me and my family. So my point, of course, is, is that the marginal tax rate, according to supply siders, is the most important thing. Because you notice in the example A and B above, the total taxes paid are exactly the same. But under A version of taxes, it stifles the desire of entrepreneurs, investors, business people, and workers to put in more effort. Whereas under tax system B with the lower marginal tax rate, the incentive to continue pushing forward for more is stronger. And so that's the supply side argument as to why we should have low marginal tax rates.